Did you know? Sword and Shield weren't originally going to have Pokemon roaming around in the wild. The Gala region was going to have a wild area, sure, but it was just going to be a big empty route. For the first few years of development, it was all random encounters in tall grass. But less than a year before the games released, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee hit store shelves and Game Freak saw how much fans loved the overworld Pokemon. According to Sword and Shield's director, Shigeru Omori, they worked extra hard to implement the feature before launch and had to completely rebalance Galar to get it to work. The final games used a mix of both roaming Pokemon and random encounters. According to Omori, they used both to satisfy fans of the old games as well as newer fans who liked Let's Go. But in a much more practical sense, they went with the dual system approach due to technical challenges. Game Freak didn't know how many Pokemon they could make appear in the overworld all at once, so hiding some in the grass was a development shortcut to squeeze them in before the release deadline. Back in 2016, the Pokemon team knew that the next Nintendo console was going to be a hybrid system codenamed NX, but internally they had doubts about the hardware's future. Pokemon Company CEO Tsunekazu Ishihara said, I told Nintendo that Switch wouldn't be a success before it went on sale, because I thought in the age of the smartphone, no one would carry around a game console. It wasn't love at first sight for series producer Junichi Masuda either. A few weeks before Sword and Shield's hit store shelves, he said instead of the Switch, Game Freak would have preferred developing for a new DS model. But Ishihara and Masuda eventually realized they were wrong and went all in, determined to take advantage of the Switch's horsepower and make Gen 8 the best Pokemon games yet. Development for Sword and Shield actually started before Sun and Moon were even finished, while Masuda and Omori were on a promotional tour in the United Kingdom. The UK's strength seemed to be a good fit for what they hoped would become the series' strongest entries. According to Omori, in terms of sort of historical industry development, the industrial revolution, and also in terms of the modern day, things like sports, the UK is historically quite strong in those aspects as well. So when thinking of the strongest Pokemon games, the UK came to mind as a really suitable area to base it on. Omori traveled around the UK sketching early concepts, like this drawing he made for Galar Pokemon Centers. He jotted down some notes in Japanese, so for your convenience, we've translated all the concept art in this video into English. In older games, NPCs just kind of stood around in Pokemon Centers for no discernible reason. So for Galar, he wanted Pokemon Centers to look like typical UK pubs, which gave people a believable reason for being there all day. Well, that's what Omori said, but Pokemon Centers in the final game didn't end up looking nearly as pub-like as his concept art. Omori also visited Windermere, where he was inspired by the town's atmosphere, countless sheep, and walls of stacked dry stone. He drew this sketch that ultimately became Postwick, so we suppose you could say Sword and Shield's hometown was based on Windermere. This other sketch Omori made in the Lake District ended up as Route 2, and while he was there, he heard a legend that catching cotton balls floating in the air could bring good fortune, which was used to create Gossiflor. Later, he took a train through the English countryside and made this art of the lakes and towns he saw in the distance, which served as inspiration for the wild area, as well as the train riding scene at the start of the game. Omori and Masuda later brought on James Turner, an Englishman who happened to be the only non-Japanese member of the Pokemon design team. James got his start in spin-off games like Pokemon Coliseum and Gale of Darkness, then moved up to working on the mainline series starting in Gen 5. He's actually the only person that worked on the Ore Region games and the Core series. Galar's based on his homeland, so they promoted him all the way to Art Director. James drafted much more detailed concept art of patchwork farmland, sheep, and English-style homes, which the team used to build the Galar region. He also made this artwork of a stadium TV broadcast, and with that, much of the game's UI was based on the typical flat design you tend to see on sports channels. According to James, only two or three out of every ten Pokemon Game Freak drew made it into Pokemon Sword and Shield. In other words, about 300 Pokemon ended up in the trash. He said that so many designs have already been done before, that it's getting more and more difficult to come up with new ideas. As James explained it, it's like trying to park in a really crowded car park or something. You're going this way, there's a car there. You're going that way, there's a car. You're trying to find some unique space. This color scheme has been used before, this animal has been used before, you're trying to find something unique. That's important. That might have been why Sword and Shield, arguably more than any previous generation, had so many Pokemon based on the region itself. In a Japanese interview we translated, Omori said that more so than older games, for Gen 8, they did thorough research on the region's real-life flora, fauna, and culture. An example he gave was how Japanese leeks are small, but in the UK they're big and chunky, which is how Surfetched was born. He also said they saw a steam engine, then drew up Galarian Weezing. Gigantamax and Dynamax forms were inspired by UK legends about giants, which persist to this day. Likewise, Stonejourner, based on megalith structures like England's Stonehenge, and Gigantamax Duraldon is the UK's tallest skyscraper the Shard. Corviknight draws from the Black Knight literary trope, and Phalanx form a group of soldiers in Phalanx formation. The Pokedex calls Boltund and Thievil natural enemies, a nod to traditional British fox hunting, and Carcoal is based on a minecart because the Industrial Revolution and coal mining began in Great Britain. 
A less obvious one is Runrigis, who is clearly based on runestones, which are the rocks that Vikings used as gravestones. The stories of dead Vikings are written all over runestones, and sometimes the image of an animal too. This is why the Pokedex says to never touch Runrigis, or you'll be shown the horrific memories behind the pictures carved into it. It also explains why Runrigis is ground and ghost type. It's a gravestone after all. Some fans think Gigantamax Mouth is based on the Long Cat Internet meme, but Game Freak doesn't have a history of making meme Pokemon. Actually, it appears to be a more British-specific reference. During Sword and Shield's development, Omori said he'd been watching a lot of Monty Python, and the Monty Python show, as well as one of the movies, both contain a classic animation where a giant cat with outstretched arms terrorizes a city. Likewise, Cantonian Mouth was based on Japanese culture. According to series creator Satoshi Tajiri, it's a representation of the Japanese proverb, a coin to a cat. That's what Japanese people say when someone's acting like a cat with a coin stuck on his head, unable to appreciate the value it holds because they're simple-minded. It's basically the Japanese version of Pearls Before Swine. Sword and Shield's big bad legendary Eternatus appears to be based on the Xenomorph Queen from the Alien films. That's really more of a theory of ours than a hard fact, but the case is pretty strong with lots of history behind it. We'll probably never get a solid confirmation from Game Freak, and that's kind of our fault in a way. We've covered a lot of lost Pokemon history, but this time, it sorta of got lost because of us. Let me explain. Over the years, James Turner made thousands of tweets, many of them when he only had a few hundred followers. Back in 2019, we went through every tweet he ever made for research purposes to get some behind the scenes info on the Pokemon design process. For example, he said Guzzlord is partially based on Agrajag from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and Vanillux was inspired by the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. More importantly though, he said he was a big fan of H.R. Giger the artist most famous for designing the alien xenomorph, and that he made Naganadal to look, quote, sleek and alien, and that its original design had legs, just like a xenomorph. Sounds a lot like Giger's alien, doesn't it? We started quoting James's old tweets, then literally the next day he deleted 96 tweets from his account, including everything we'd just copied. Our quotations got a lot more attention than his original tweets from years earlier, and it seems someone at Game Freak didn't want James sharing this kind of detail, so he purged his account of all behind the scenes information. As for Eternatus, it's literally an alien, according to the Pokedex. It's also poison dragon type, exactly what a xenomorph would be if it was a Pokemon. There's a pretty strong resemblance as well, just look at him. James also draws Xenomorph fan art and posts it online. But like we said, because of the whole tweet purge thing, we don't expect to get solid confirmation from James or anyone else at Game Freak. Especially after he denied our request for an interview because of corporate rules. But the alien homages actually go all the way back to Gen 2, long before James became art director. Gligar bears a strong resemblance to a baby Xenomorph, also known as a facehugger. Gligar's beta sprite looked even more like a facehugger, and Gligar's Japanese name, Guraiga, is literally just H.R. Giger's name with an L slapped in. Giger designed the facehugger, xenomorph, and the queen, so it all comes full circle. Pokemon designs have been inspired by the Alien franchise for decades, and Eternatus is the ultimate manifestation of that inspiration. Perfect organism. Speaking of the perfect organism, here's what Eternatus looked like in Sword and Shield's beta build. Some more interesting James Turner tweets highlighted the theme of the Obstagoon family. Zigzagoon is a zigzag, Linoon's a straight line, and Obstagoon's an obstacle. He was the designer who made all their Galarian forms. When Obstagoon was first revealed, KISS band member Gene Simmons thanked Game Freak for making a Pokemon based on his likeness. He said he was flattered as his kids have been playing Pokemon for decades. Game Freak never accepted his thanks or acknowledged the inspiration, maybe for the same reason all of those tweets got deleted. But the similarities are definitely striking. And the last Gen 8 design we're going to cover is Galarian Sloking, who, similar to Eternatus, was a continuation of the franchise's earliest designs. In the old magazine we translated from Japan, art director Ken Sugimori says that he likes to add a new Pokemon who's dribbling something in every generation, like Gloom dribbling his saliva in Gen 1, or Cubchoo with his snot in Gen 5. In that same historical vein, Sloking is the dribbler of Galar. Game Freak doubled their team size from about 100 developers working on Sun and Moon to 200 for Sword and Shield. They were working on other games as well, as part of a company initiative called The Gear Project. We talked about The Gear Project more in depth in our Pokemon Z video, but just to sum it up, The Gear Project was the studio's plan to make another hit series that would be just as successful as Pokemon. According to one of Game Freak's directors, Masayuki Onoe, there are two different production teams here, simply named Production Team 1 and Production Team 2. Team 1 is fully dedicated to the Gear Project, while Team 2 is for the Pokemon operation. What that means is that Game Freak as a company is prioritizing Gear Project, which is production team number 1, more than Pokemon in general. With the Gear Project, we're targeting PS4, Xbox One, and PC. One of these games was an RPG called Little Town Hero, which released a month before Sword and Shield, but got pretty low review scores and didn't sell well. 
Another game they briefly started but never finished was Project Tezu, a sort of stylized retro mech side-scroller. James Turner tweeted out this gameplay footage, but just like all those other tweets, the footage later got deleted. Fortunately, we've already downloaded it. Some fans said Game Freak shouldn't have been making other games and instead focus 100% on just Pokemon. Many were disappointed with Sword and Shield's animations, that less than half the series Pokemon made it into Sword and Shield, and the supposedly Nintendo 64 tree textures. A vocal minority promised to boycott, and that wasn't exclusive to the West. Japanese fans were mad too. One story that sticks out is when a Japanese fan said Bayleaf was their favorite Pokemon and she couldn't wait to see it in Galar, Junichi Masuda retweeted her saying thank you. Thing was, Bayleaf wasn't actually in Sword and Shield. It was one of the Pokemon who didn't make the cut. Masuda got swamped with hundreds of replies calling him heartless, a scammer and a psychopath. He later said those kinds of interactions with fans got him pretty bummed. But after all the Twitter criticism and boycotts, Masuda felt a lot better when Sword and Shield ended up selling almost twice as many copies as previous generations. As of this video's publication, they're still the best-selling Pokemon games for the Switch. Did you also know that there's a lost Pokemon game that fans are trying to restore right now? For more on that, click or tap the video on screen. Also, I'm Ron from True Green 7, by the way, a channel all about Pokemon and Pokemon art. Special thanks to our translator, Jacob, Eurasia for footage, Snorlax Monster for proofreading, and thank you for watching. See you next time.